That's just an incredible song. Singing of God's holiness. I may have said before, but that's the only attribute of God that's consecutively repeated three times in all of Scripture. Uh, God's never said to to be love, 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 or just, 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 or righteous, right. The only one that's ever been said is, the, is, the, is His holiness. Holy, 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 which leads some people to believe that God's holiness is His most important attribute. You know, we let theologians uh, discuss that one, but it certainly is, is right up there, if not the most important of all the things God is. And when we get in touch with His holiness, which we never fully do, uh, our lives change. Because when you're when you see and you experience uh, that whole other purity of, of God, you can't help but see and think and change certain thoughts and behaviors. And we're in this series, uh, second week, of ten thoughts to rethink. Uh, because the truth is, is everyone is wrong about something every day. And you probably didn't want to hear that, but it's true for all of us, right? We're all, we're all wrong about, I want to say that more than one thing, we're all wrong about numerous things every day. You may go, well, what? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I just know that, that you are and I am and we all are, and that shouldn't be a surprise. That's not to be a, a downer for you. Just to understand that when any, anyone ever corrects you, that maybe it was needed. Uh, it's just the way that things are. And so, you know, with that, we're getting into this thoughts that need to be re-examined because they may not be all that correct. Rarely do we examine our thoughts, but really we should. So here is... No, what's that? <laughs> Maybe I was being corrected already. I didn't know, but... Well, okay, I, I, I get it. Um, here we go. Thought number two, forgiving means forgetting. You may have... You may have heard that, or you may have said that, you may even believe that, but let's, let's rethink that thought this morning. And uh, with that, the, we could also say, if, if you haven't forgotten, then that means you haven't forgiven, which then, for some folks, puts guilt upon them because they know they haven't forgotten. And, and so now, here again, I'm trying to, to push that thought away. Have you discovered by now the harder you try to not think about something, the more lodged it becomes in your in your mind, in your brain, and now it's there even more. You know, someone says, don't think about a pink elephant. Don't think about a pink elephant. And of course, what happens is, now I've put that thought in your mind, and that's what we often try to do. We just try to make something go away. Uh, but it doesn't. And so, and even praying about something, we'll just pray that it'll go away. Often even praying about it doesn't make it go away. So, anyway, as with almost everything, almost every thought has some truth to it. And when it comes to the things of God or in church, often there is a, a verse or verses that seem to support that or we wouldn't be thinking like that. We wouldn't maybe be teaching these things. So, here is a, a, a verse we're going to look at that, that could seem to support that when God forgives, God forgets. Here we go. I will be merciful to their, actually, in, I think it's in, iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. I will remember their sins no more. You go, well, well there you go. I mean, so when, when God forgives. God doesn't remember those sins. You may have been told, if, if you repent of a sin and God forgives it, and, and you for repent of that sin again, God says, what sin? I don't even remember what you're talking about, because that's what God does with sin. Or you could go the other way around, and this is uh, having to do with, with Noah and the, and the ark, then he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land from, from man to animals to creeping things and to the birds of the sky and they were blotted out from the earth and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark and the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days but God remembered Noah and, and all the beasts and all the cattle 
that were within him or with with were with him in, in the ark. And then what are you thinking? Did God remember Noah? Did did God have a senior moment? Did God all of a sudden he he got preoccupied? He got busy and he had forgotten about Noah. And we're going that we know that's not true. They don't even say that. No, God doesn't have those moments like we have those moments. Because we all forget numerous things. So we're just thinking, well, if we forget and we're made in the image of God, well, then certainly God must sometimes forget as well. I don't go, let me say this. God can no more remember than he can cease to remember. That is, forget. God doesn't remember. I go, he doesn't remember the fact that he had forgotten and now he remembers. Then he can ever not remember anything because if you're dealing with with one of the other attributes of god that is his omniscience god's omniscience mean, means he knows everything about everyone every thought every intent of our heart often we don't even know why we do what we do we just do it we run on autopilot well god knows the motives behind our actions God knows why we say what we say and why we, when, when we remain silent. Why we, He knows all of these things, so he cannot, let's say, remember that he had forgotten, nor can he ever forget or it does away with God's omniscience, and we don't want to touch that attribute. In fact, there is no fact, there is no data of which he is ever at any one point unaware of. Never. God knows so much that he even knows what would have happened, although it never happened. What? We go, well, what would have happened? What would have happened if, if, uh, let's say, Peyton Manning didn't retire? What would have happened next year if he came back and played? And we answer, not good stuff, right? It would not be a good decision. So he retires, and that's what he should have done. But if he would happen to change his mind, like Brett Favre always seemed to change his mind, and came back next year, what would happen? Well, we're not going to know that. But God knows what would have happened if he would have come back. Say, really? Yeah. Here, here's, it's, I think it's an important uh, verse in Scripture. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mere if if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now it, they did not occur, so they did not repent. But but if that if that would have occurred, they would have repented. God knows what would have happened, although it never happened. Have you ever thought, well, I wonder how my life would be different if, if we had moved. I wonder how my life would be different if, if I would have went to school or I went to a different school. Or I, I went to the military, but I, but I didn't. Or if I was in a different branch of the military. I wonder how life would have been different if, if I wouldn't have got that car. I wonder how life would be different if I wouldn't have taken that job. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And, and we're just sitting there. We all do that sometimes. And the answer is this, we have no idea. God knows. He knows what would have happened if we would have made that decision. Theologians call this middle knowledge. Middle knowledge. We have no middle knowledge. I go, that's how much God knows. And if God knows, has middle knowledge... He certainly doesn't remember or forget those things which are factual, which did occur. You go, that blows my mind. Yeah, mine too. The, the mind of God, who God is, is it's, it's incredible. We'll, we'll never fully comprehend that. It's amazing. So what does this mean then? When, when God remembers or, or God has... No, no longer remembers things. And what it, what it means is this. When he remembers it, it means he renews his work. He remembered Noah. I'm renewing my work. 
not that I've forgotten, with a person or with a situation. He renews his work. When, when the Bible says God no longer remembers, it means he no longer responds to that person or situation in light of normally their sin. He renews his work with, as we remembered, or God no longer, he, he no longer uh, responds to that in, in light of their sin. You may have heard that, that God hears the prayer of the righteous, but not the unrighteous. What's that mean? When an unrighteous person in prayer, God goes, no, 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 you know, I, I, I cannot, I don't know, I'm not sure what you're saying, I can't hear you. No, no, no. God knows, he knows the words, he understands, but I will not respond to the prayers of the unrighteous. That's what it means. So don't get into the fact, well, you know, God is, God is deaf to someone's prayer. God actually audibly hears the words of a righteous person, but that's not what it's talking about. So when, so when it talks about God forgiving, it, it never means God has thou forgotten. I cannot recall that which you have done. Because that's not what the Bible really says. That's not what it means. That's not what forgiveness means. Secondly, forgiveness does not mean that everything returns to where it was prior to that sin. Forgiveness is an incredible thing and you know, we all need forgiveness. We all need forgiveness really all the time. But what forgiveness does not mean, now we get to be back to a place where it's like we had never done. There are no consequences. We've, re, re, we've re-round the tape and it, it's, it's, like, it's like that it never at all happened. So we ought to be able to go back to, to point A again. And move on from there. You say, well, that's, that's not good news. But it's, it's true. Here, when, when God inquires of King David, he says, why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, You've taken his wife to be your wife. And you've killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, now therefore, the, the sword shall never depart from your house. Really? There will be consequences. There will be ongoing consequences, David, for what you have done. The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Well, you say, well, maybe David hasn't repented. Maybe he hasn't been forgiven. Maybe that's the issue. But no, that's not the issue. Because the next verse, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And and Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. Because God could have just and wiped him out. Like he occasionally does in Scripture. He did in in, in Acts 8. You shall not die. David goes, whew, that's a relief. We're not done with this verse. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme... The child also that is born to you shall surely die. David, you're not going to die, but that child that was born out of that relationship between you and Bathsheba, there's no doubt here, it will certainly, this child shall certainly die. And often this, this passage causes some upset or some like, well, that's not right. Well, why does, why does this infant who has done nothing wrong, by the way, have to pay the penalty for something that basically David and, and Bathsheba did? Why, why does he have to pay the price for the sin that he did not commit? Here's the thing. Whenever any of us sin, it's never solely individual in its consequences. Our sins always impact those who are closest to us, not just alone. 
Why does someone else have to pay? Just because that's the way sin works. I didn't do anything. I get it. Sin impacts the innocent. And in a couple days, sure enough, that's what happened. Now, David did not say, that's not fair. He just took it on. See, whenever there's repentance, basically, you receive from God what God decides to do, although you've been forgiven. A couple things. One, I go spiritually and eternally. When we are forgiven, there are no consequences and our record is clean. I go, that is spiritually and eternally. But, earthly and temporarily or temporally, down here, forgiveness seldom, if ever, removes all the consequences or restores all that is broken. It can perhaps, but, but seldom. It does, though, offer a second chance. I go, if, if you have been caught speeding and you are pulled over, the officer may be compassionate and you may be forgiven, but you will have a ticket. If you have robbed a bank, you may have returned the money, you may have been forgiven, but you will go to jail. If for years you've been drinking alcohol, you may have come to a place where you've stopped and, and you've been forgiven, but you may deal with the consequences of that for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that all the consequences automatically go away just because you're forgiven. We wish it was like that, but it's seldom like that. Third thing, forgiveness does not equal trust. There's a lot of guilt that some people have because they know they can't trust so-and-so anymore. Does that mean they haven't forgiven and that they haven't forgiven them? They're not of God and they don't want to be caught in that. But overwhelmingly in Scripture, overwhelmingly, our trust is to be in God. Again and again and again. Put your trust in the Lord. Put your trust in God. Trust in Him. Don't trust in your own ways. Don't trust. Trust in God. Don't trust your heart. You trust in God. Occasionally it speaks of trusting in a friend or Proverbs 31, trusting in a righteous wife. If you're a husband, you can trust a righteous wife, which means something interesting. Uh, an unrighteous wife or an unrighteous spouse, uh, maybe we don't trust or how can you? And we understand that trust is one of the most important things in any and every relationship. It's so key. Because if you don't have trust, what do you have? You don't have much. And some of you have found that in your relationships that, that trust has been broken. You've misplaced your... They have proven themselves not to be trustworthy. It's not just they've forgotten. They have premeditatively done things, said things, maybe even lied to you. Or if, if nothing else, they have maybe deceived you. And there's things in their life, and you go, how... How can I trust you where, where now I have to check I have to check our bank account because of you on a daily basis. I have somebody may have to go out to the car and check the odometer to really say, see, did you really go where you said you went? Always looking around corners. I'm not saying don't hang in there. I'm not saying don't work it out. I'm just saying it's tough to have a, a good relationship when, when trust is gone. And you know, in the last year and a half, I've 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 been living here, and my wife and boys are they're out in out in Pennsylvania. And you know, when we first got married, maybe that wouldn't have worked out. But if there wasn't trust in the relationship, it wouldn't have worked out at all. I can I can I I can just tell you. That I am, I fully trust my wife, although she's hundreds of miles from here, and she fully trusts me. We've had that conversation. It's not, it's not like that there aren't temptations. That's, that's not true at all. But is there trust? And that's huge. And by the way, 
when we get that goofy house sold, she'll be out. She'll be out and be with me. And so, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I told you this. You know, they record these sermons. <laughs> I think what she does, she watches like the first minute to see what I'm wearing. <laughs> then she just turns it off. But, uh, I think, I think. But um, a- anyway, she doesn't trust me to dress myself. It's just, <laughs> that is not true. And uh, and when she does come out, I'll just tell you guys, when she does come out, you know, she goes into the closet and she lines things up. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. It hurts, doesn't it? But okay, with, with these pair of pants, you got those two shirts. And the shoes are underneath that, okay? So you, you get that. And then the next one, and he, it's, the, it's the same thing. Now, when the weather's cold, we, then we switch over to this. And it, it's just this elaborate system. I've got it all messed up because I don't put them back to where it should be. Uh, but it's, it's, it's weird, weird uh, sorts of things. Um, so, so when I say trust, there are certain areas where she just knows it's. And I, by the way, I don't think, I don't think to, to not correctly color coordinate clothes is a sin. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Can I, can, I, can I get a witness, brother? Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I'm I'm just saying, and some of you guys are really good at it. Others, we. Can I just, this is just a moment of honesty here. Number one, we don't care. Okay? We don't care. Right. Amen. Amen, my brother. Amen. We don't care. And so it doesn't, the other thing, we don't notice in other people what they wear. We, we don't. Did you see? And, and sometimes she goes, I know this is a bit of a, a little rabbit trail, but she goes, didn't you wear that last week? How do I know, right? How do I know what I wore last week? Yeah, watch my video. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys this. I'm going to tell you guys this. And I, I can say it now. That when I interviewed here, I interviewed. Uh, we're sitting around and then they're asking the question, do you want to come? It's like being like on a, on a first date. You want everything to go really, really well and stuff. And about an, there was a break in the action. My wife leans over and says, your shirt's on inside out. <clears throat> True story. Some of you go, yeah, we are there. We are there. Almost didn't even hire you. I mean, how, how can you pass your church? You can't even dress yourself. Inside out, tags sticking out on the other way. Now here I am. You know, I'm a grown man. I, let's, and I can't even... It's it's crazy stuff, but it, but anyway, it, but it's not a forgiveness issue, okay? It's not a forgiveness issue, and so on we go, on we go. <laughs> this is what I want you to know: that forgiveness, though it does not equal forgetting, in time will neither remember as much nor will it carry ill feelings or ill intent toward another. Forgiveness does not keep score. It doesn't say that it's all right. See, if it was okay, it never would have had to have forgiveness. But it, it doesn't keep score. It doesn't regurgitate the past. It doesn't say, hey, you know, I would, but I back and whenever. And didn't. so therefore, it doesn't keep bringing this stuff up. I mean, if any, we, see, we all have a past. And not everything is pretty in our past. We hold that common. We all have stuff that that we wish and we're sorry we ever thought or did. We all have that. And so, with that being no exception, we don't, you can't move forward relationally if, if, if that continues to consume you. So you, you don't bring it up, you don't rekindle it, you certainly don't stoke that fire, but 
um, although it doesn't forgive, I go, in time, if it doesn't reoccur, see, if it keeps coming back up, well, you have to keep going back. But in time, if it doesn't reoccur, it doesn't carry as much ill feelings or ill intent toward another person. You say, well, how do you know that? Because of this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just and God in Christ also has forgiven you. See that anger stuff? Chuck it. No, don't be around walking around mad. And slander, maliciousness. Get rid of that stuff. If you're ever going to be angry, choose to be angry. And don't be a victim. Well, it just happened. No, no. You choose whether you should or whether you shouldn't be angry. Have that kind of self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Don't just be angry. Something happened, oh, and away you go. Put it away. Have a, have a kind heart. Have a, have a tender heart. And that happens by way of forgiveness. One who is angry, one who talks poorly of others, one who is not kind, one who is not tender is also one who is not forgiven. Part of the issue with forgiveness is sometimes we just don't want to. And other times it doesn't make any sense. Because they they should pay a price. And if I forgive them, well then they're off the hook. And if they're off the hook, well then they're more likely just to do it again because there's been no consequences. And so they think that it's, it's not right and I don't want to. I don't care what the Bible says, but the Bible also says if you don't forgive others, neither has God forgiven you. And so what does that say? Well, yeah, I know I should, but I can't, and it's really hard, and, and on and on that conversation can go. And so we hold up these, these grudges, we build up these walls, and we will not let them down because if, if we do, it doesn't seem to make any sense. The pain that I feel is not right or fair because oftentimes when someone has sinned against you, there's an incredible amount of pain. And the closer they are to you, the worse it hurts. You say, well, I, I want that pain to go away, and it hasn't gone away, and oh my, they need to pay. Someone needs to pay for my pain, and I didn't do anything. I'm innocent, so they're going to pay. You know, the, the Bible says that God says that vengeance or revenge is mine. Leave it up to me. So it's not your place. It's not my place to go out and to, to, to make people pay for their sin or their cruelty to me or to anyone else because God says uh, I'll, I'll take care of that. God will make sure that they or anyone will pay for anything they have done that has not been forgiven. Let me put that in there. That has not been forgiven. For us, I say, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. See, it's hard to understand sins of others which we don't struggle with. I, I threw out there the rob a bank thing because, and I know people still do it, but I don't know anyone who really has. But if they have, are you like me? What were you thinking? How dumb is that? To rob a bank. Don't you know they got cameras and they do funny things with the money and they got dye and things explode in there and, and you probably won't get away with it and you're going to go to jail and, you know, bad things happen. Yeah, come on. Because we've never done that. We've never really thought about robbing a bank. And it's like other kinds of sin. If, if you've never shoplifted, well, why would you do that for what, what people think? And that's kind of dumb. Or if you've never vandalized something before. 
Why? Well, why are they doing that? That's just... That. And, and in your mind, you can't wrap your mind around that. It's harder to forgive something which we don't even struggle with. Forgive it anyway, because God is given the inexcusable in us. I go, forgiveness is always a righteous gift to the unrighteous. A gift which cancels the sin, but not necessarily the consequences. It's a gift which keeps hope alive. It's a gift of another chance. But it's a gift, and a gift is never earned. It can only be given. A gift which we will never deserve, but which we desperately need. We will never live well unless we both receive and dispense forgiveness. And we need both. Whatever we have freely received from God, we are to freely pass on to others. And with that, two closing thoughts from a man by the name of Lewis Smeads who has written on the subject of forgiveness. He writes, forgiving is the only way to heal the wounds of a past we cannot change and cannot forget. Many of us here have been deeply wounded by someone we deeply trusted. And we can't change that. And we can't forget that. The only way to move forward is to forgive because forgiveness has a way of healing that which can't be healed in any other way. There may have been people who have, who have tried to destroy your reputation or destroy your life or the life or the reputation of your family. And you want to come out swinging. But you need to forgive. Because when we forgive, we walk in stride with the forgiving God. And that's what God has called us to do. For he is holy, holy, holy. May we do that. Pray with me, Lord. It's impossible or it's easy. It's desirable or it's detestable. When we think of forgiveness. We're glad to be on the receiving end, but... Sometimes we don't want to be on the end of the one dispensing or the giving of the forgiveness, but we need to. And it's not just for us, but it is for us as well. We won't move past. We won't move into Christ-likeness apart from forgiveness. Lord, help us to better get a handle on one of these most important issues in Christianity. Lots of things it doesn't mean, but it, it does mean. What it does mean is we do move forward and we do give someone another chance at life because everyone here needs another chance every day. So we thank you for your forgiveness and may we be those who also forgive and forgive well and forgive often and forgive deeply. And so the world gets healed. We pray this now in Christ's name. Amen.